here we go. <laughs> Got okay. it. <clears throat> hmm. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome. We're so glad to have you here for um, another live art toolkit demo. And today I'm just thrilled. Um, my name is Maria Coriel Martin, the founder of Art Toolkit. Hi, everyone. Oh, let me just mute this. Excuse me. Um, but I'm so thrilled to be joined by Latasha Green. And Latasha, you are uh, an illustrator living in Colorado and often inspired by nature and travel. And you just do gorgeous paintings. We can see some behind you and illustration projects, um, as well as sculpting and designing stickers. You've got this really wonderful breadth of, of work you do. And today we're, we're just so excited to have you here for some inspiration on something um, that many of us have at home for inspiration. And we've been talking a bit about winter and that's thinking about pets and um, you shared with me when we were talking about ideas for this demo, just this really beautiful story of how you got the idea for these pet portraits. So wondered if you might want to share a little background of um, your inspiration. And I'll just briefly say everyone who's who's logging and watching, we'd love to hear where you're logging in from. And I'll be keeping an eye on the chat too. So I'll be happy to relay questions for Latasha as we go. Cool. Thank you so much. Um... I'm super happy to be here. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, like she said, my name is Latasha. I use she, her pronouns, and I um, currently reside in Denver. <clears throat> I've been an artist my entire life, and I've currently been a full-time illustrator for the last five years. And when I first started my illustration journey, um, it was really hard because it's really hard to break into being a full-time artist in general. Um, there's a lot that goes into it, but I knew kind of what I wanted to do, which was, you know, this type of nature-y, um, botanical, colorful work. And I was really getting um, a, a couple commissions here and there. And I wanted, I knew that doing pet portraits would be a um, fun and easy way to offer some type of like themed commission um, to like start to, you know, get a little money. And one thing I learned really early on in my art journey is that you have to create the work that you want to be hired for. So, oh, so mm -hmm. Yeah, so personal projects are a really big part of your artistic development. And I would say that my the handful of personal projects that I've done over the last six years have always had tremendous um, outcomes in like in the long run. And this is definitely one of them because I haven't actually done any pet portrait commissions in years. But people will frequently ask me about them because I do keep the work cataloged on my website. And so back to my story, when I was first getting started, I wanted to, you know, give myself some type of prompt. So like, how can I create pet portraits that um, will like go somewhere and not just like sit in my desk? Because you can you can do that too. You can just create work. But it's really nice if you have some type of client, right? Mm -hmm. Where you kind of like create a client. It can be for anything. Um, and so I contacted my local animal shelter and I, I pitched this idea to them that I wanted to build my pet portrait portfolio. And I was wondering if they had any um, pets that had been sitting for longer than the average mm -hmm. and if I could offer portraits that would um, help promote them and then also go in their file and be a like gift for the person who adopts them whenever they get adopted and um they love the idea and I want to say I did I don't know maybe like three dozen portraits over that year I would go in and sometimes I would take my own pictures. Sometimes I didn't have the time to do so. So they would just send me pictures and I would essentially make these simple portraits and pair them with like a name and 
some were more simple than others. And I, and I was experimenting. Like I would, I did some that were just black and white ink drawings. I did some that were watercolor. I did some that were color pencil because essentially I was like, there's no, there were no parameters, right? Like I'm just doing this out of my own uh, creativity and the kindness of my heart. And luckily they were open to receiving some free art to go for their pets. So that was um, a really fun collaboration that I did at the beginning of my career that really beefed up my pet portrait portfolio that you see on my website now and allowed me to then be able to be like, this is a body of work already. And you should hold me to do it for you. Yeah. Oh, it's such a brilliant idea because you got the chance to like experiment with your style, but have a body of work instead of just, you know, painting random things or whatnot and and developing your voice and helping, helping a really sweet organization. I can just imagine having adopted animals from the shelter, how (laughs) sweet it must've been for those people to get an actual hand handmade portrait. Um, Yeah. And I don't think, I think only one person ended up reaching out, like finding out who I was. Cause I don't remember if I left any contact information. I think like the, the, the contact person I had at the shelter had my information, but I didn't like staple a card to it or anything. I just put mm-hmm. like a small signature. Um, so the only one person had ended up like reaching out and like sent me a picture um, of a cat that they had adopted. But then you got a whole, you know, with your website and everything. Um, I'm sure you've gotten, gotten some other other things that have grown from it. Oh yeah, for sure. Like I um have actually last night was doing an art market and I had no type of pet portraits on display, but the woman happened to ask me, do you do pet portraits? And I was like, yes. And I actually told her about this live and everything. If you're watching this live, that's crazy. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I told her about this live and how I was going to be doing a demo and how she can look at my catalog of pet portraits on my website. Oh, oh, that's so wonderful. Well, um, yeah, we're really excited to, to sketch with you. And we put the link um, in our YouTube to the, the photo that you um, shared oh, with yeah. us. Um, and so uh, if anyone watching, if you want to to grab that, you can you can download that. And um, Latasha, should we pull up your desk and um, dive in? Um, sure. I want to talk about, I guess, materials. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about materials. And um, I guess just to add a little more background about myself, I uh, do have an art degree from Virginia Commonwealth University um, in Richmond, Virginia. And I was in the communication arts department and got my degree in uh, scientific and medical illustration. Mm -hmm. And I thought I wanted to do medical but then I went more to the natural science, which was more botanical art and plants and animals. And um, I loved it. It was very hard. It was extremely difficult to do, but it led me more towards doing what I do now, which is like um, plein air painting, landscapes, uh, and like doing artwork in the outdoor industry. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, that's just a little more background about me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you've got that so, mix of your your technical background and then your own your own projects as well that come together. But I have long since thrown the technical stuff out the window. <laughs> it was a little it was a little crippling, honestly. Like, and I knew that I wasn't going to be doing technical drawing in mm-hmm. my career. Like, it's just not. There's no room for creativity in it, which I didn't know before I went into that field. And as much as I loved being able to paint and make it seem like you can pick it up off the page, it's Mm -hmm. an awesome thing to have. After five years of it, I truly like did not know how to be creative anymore. Like a blank Mm -hmm. page was very intimidating um, because I was so used to working from specimens and real life references. Um, that I just didn't know how to be creative anymore. I had lost my sketchbook practice and all of that. So it was it was interesting. It was an interesting way of being an artist. Um, mm-hmm. because it's so much more when you're in medical illustration, it's like 70% research and science and 30% art making, mm. um, which I loved. But knowing that I wanted to be an artist, I was like, all right, I need to like 
figure out how to be creative again. Where's my style? Like, what does my style look like? And so it was a journey to get where I am now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. But definitely it helped. It helped. helped. Yeah. Learn a lot of rules and then figure out how to break them. I'm sure. (laughs) And what to let go of. Yeah. Exactly how it was. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. So for materials, um, my favorite, you guys asked me what my favorite materials to use were. So uh, first up, a pencil. I don't have a favorite pencil type. A pencil. (laughs) (laughs) Don't have a favorite type. And then I, when I'm sitting at my desk, I tend to use regular paintbrushes. But when I am out and about, I use the like water brush pens. Mm -hmm. Um, I definitely have a favorite water brush pen and it's by Pentel. Because there are a lot of different, um, there's a lot of like off-brand brush pens. Pentel is Japanese and they're the OG and they don't break and they last a long time. And I've hundred percent brands. Yeah, I've tried different brands and they break after a while. Some of the brushes, like if you pull the brushes, the brushes just come right out. I'm like, oh, <sighs> So crazy, but yeah, Pentel's my favorite travel paintbrush. I like too the the oval barrel. That's what we include in our art toolkits. The oval barrel doesn't roll away too. Yeah. <laughs> little little things. <laughs> it all it all makes sense. I've even had some cheap brands like when you go to squeeze, the water be leaking out the um the seams. Yeah, I'm like, oh my gosh. But um, when I am in studio, I don't really have a favorite brush I haven't or brush brand I haven't tried too many but what I'm currently painting with are Princeton brushes and oh just Princeton brushes apparently I do have a brand okay (laughs) I have a few colors um but I'm almost always painting with a round brush Mm -hmm. Uh, I do have a couple like fluffy flat brushes for washes but that's truly just for the wash, um, which is like 5% of the process. And everything is done with, I would say I probably use size 10 or size six the most, Um, Mm -hmm. even for fine details. I don't even really use a detailer because if you keep your brush um, really well maintenanced, it can get super pointy and get those fine details free. I am ha- I have this watercolor sketchbook right here, which is my go-to just because of affordability. But the Canson watercolor um, OG sketchbook, you can find it in Walmart, you can find it in everywhere. Uh, love it. And the watercolor paper is decent. It's not what I do my like full-blown, like lots of lots of layers on. That's Arches paper. Um, But just for like everyday watercolors, uh, this paper can give a good like three layers um, before it starts to really fold. And then for paint, I really like um, Winsor & Newton. I have this, I don't know which camera we're looking at. I have this little travel um, Winsor & Newton case that Mm -hmm. I use a lot. I use it when I travel and I use it at my desk uh, just for convenience. It holds a good amount of paint in there. And um, the palette is easily cleanable. And I wanna say I use the Daniel Smith collection right now of the Windsor and Newton paint, but uh, I like all of their paints. I use their student series for 10 years. It mm-hmm. all lasts. The, the tubed paints, I they last for what feels like millennia. I have yeah. this little pouch of, um, yeah, here we go. The Daniel Smith. Yeah, those will last a long time. I have this here. I forget I have two cameras. Um, but I have the Daniel Smith collection. And yes, I have, I still have some colors from college for sure. They last forever. And that's why I think I have stuck with watercolor for so long because I used to be an oil painter, but it's just the fact that watercolor, the fact that you can bring it back to life constantly and you can travel with it, it just makes it such an accessible medium, in my opinion. Um, But that's about it. That's all I use. 
<laughs> and if I am out and about, I obviously have my little art toolkit booklet, which is not sitting here with me, but my art toolkit travel plein air case is my one of my faves as well. Oh, we're so glad you've been enjoying it. <laughs> I've almost finished the sketchbook that was in there. And um, I'm excited to do a flip through uh, video in the future because oh. there's some really awesome paintings in there from like all over the world. I've been taking that thing all around for the last couple of years. So. Oh, be sure to tag us so we can see. Yeah. Um. All right. You ready to get into the demo? I have my little reference here. Um, the first thing I want to talk about when I create a pet portrait is the reference photo. You really want the reference photo to be crisp because um, drawing animals is already hard enough. <laughs> you don't want to have to be guessing what the like jawline is looking like and like you don't want to have to be guessing that type of stuff um so you want a photo that's gonna be uh crisp and high resolution um nothing blurry or like in movement or anything like that um you would be and that seems obvious but you would laugh at like the type of reference photos that people will send to artists for portraits like you're just like am I supposed to imagine what the rest of the dog's face looks like um so yeah that's the first thing you want to have a good reference photo and then you also want it to preferably be in the pose that you want the artwork in um if it has to be a combination of photos like I've done that where like say this picture I have right here is really great for her face, but I would prefer she was laying down. Maybe I have a photo of her laying down as well and I can kind of like finesse the two together. Um, that's not like optimal, but you know, it works as long as all the photos are high resolution. And then another thing that I consider when I am creating a pet portrait for a client is what the dog or cat or chicken, because I have done a chicken. <laughs> what What is the pet's personality? Um, are they sassy? Are they lazy? Are they, you know, really big? Are they really skinny? Like, just like what type of characteristic will help inform um, the font that I'm going to use for the name? Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of adds to, it's like an accessory that kind of adds to the personality. And then I also think about like, what else do I want to include in the composition that helps either like make it more pretty or tell this pet's and owner's story. So that can be uh, an array of plants from a specific landscape that they live in. Like maybe they live in the PNW, so you want redwood trees or something hopefully that exists in the pnw i don't know <laughs> <laughs> um like maybe you know if out here i could put like i live in the rocky mountains so i could put like a cute little mountain range like flanking the pet or whatever um it's like little elements like that that will add um interest to the illustration and like a little more personal touch um so this reference photo is from my wedding. Um, we were barefoot, so excuse the toes. Oh. <laughs> and so that's me and my husband, and this is my dog and her little cute, um, whatever, her little collar. She was the ring bearer. And that's the, adorable. <laughs> so she was like the flower girl with her little flower collar on, but she had a little pouch dangling from it that had the rings in it. And she escorted her own self down the aisle and it was very cute. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is um, already sentimental enough with the, um, what do you call it? The little flower collar on, but you see how it's only her front legs here and there's mm -hmm. no back body. So I plan on um, like nestling her amongst more plants because like we're, a, I'm a planty girl, obviously. Like I have plants all around me um so naturally 
that's what I want in my pet portrait. Um, maybe your dog is a desert dweller. Maybe you love that your dog loves the desert. Lila loves the desert too. But like you could do like cactus or like agave plants around them or something like that. Or maybe they have like to like a couple favorite toys or something that you could like draw in laying on on the ground next to them um it really is dependent on the pet and the person and what other stuff they want to add to it and so again I can work with this because I plan on just like nestling her in plants but if you wanted to see more of the, the full body of your pet obviously you would choose a photo that has a full body um okay well oh, she is adorable Latasha <laughs> Lila Lila's her name Lilo Lilo how old is she is she still with you yeah she's in the next room she actually went to the vet this morning and she is doing great but uh she's going to be eight this year oh <laughs> her last adult year and then because we were looking at the little age chart after eight then they're senior <laughs> <laughs> don't call my baby senior oh like it just feels so rude okay so this is my sketchbook let me here I'll focus on uh, your our your sketchbook now and I'm just gonna move some stuff out the way so I have more light all right oh that looks good um, For what it's worth, my daughter's seven and a half, and and people people years, you're still super young at eight. <laughs> <laughs> so, the first thing I want to do is plan my composition. What shape will the overall um, illustration create? Um, so I just roughly and very lightly. I don't even know, like. I honestly am drawing so light, you may not even be able to see it on the screen, but I just want to know like where her body is going to sit. And I'm just using simple circles right now um, for her little legs. And then I want to figure out like, you know, how much foliage am I going to put around her? Where do I want the foliage? Do I want, because you can make it you could do a couple different layouts and I'm just gonna quickly show you this for an example, right? But you can have your pet and then you can have just stuff to the side like this or stuff here, right? Mm -hmm. or, or at the top. So you gotta kind of like kind of choose your composition and then like where would the name go? Right. The name is the straight line and the decorations are the squiggle line. <laughs> hmm. so, that's kind of what I like to decide in this beginning stage. But I, I already know what I'm doing because I've planned this, but <laughs> I'm going to kind of just do this like round shape of plants around her and have her name going above her like this. And I'm choosing a. I think I want to do like more of a cursive font because this um, photo is from a formal event. And my girl's a, she's a, she's a girl, girl, a girl's girl. <laughs> <laughs> she is very much a girl's girl. Okay. So I think I like the way this looks and yeah. All right, so this is my very, very light kind of composition sketch. And now I'm gonna start uh, my drawing process. And when I am drawing pets, I do not draw them in the same way that I draw humans. Um, Cause I, I'm a lot more aware of human anatomy than I am of pet anatomy, so. I kind of can inform a lot more on a human figure, but with the pet, I kind of really just try and draw what I see. I start with the, it's easiest for me to start with an outer outline, normally like the head going into the ear and then using that shape as a reference to where everything else is going to go. Um, 
if that makes sense. So I'm looking at my reference picture here and I'm looking at this ear crease and I'm kind of drawing a, a line and you can even do this with your pencil where you like put the pencil on the photo, get the angle you need and move it back to your paper. But I want to know where her nose sits relative to where her ears are just so it stays um, all in the same scale and perspective. Nothing ends up looking wonky. I love that basic measure trick. I use it with everything inside or outside of just such a shorthand. Yeah. Pencil around. And I know it like, I feel like people forget that you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> do that in my plein air painting classes like and I tell people like I will put my hand up to the landscape in a square like this yeah yeah look for the composition that I'm looking for and they're like oh what like I felt like that's so obvious and I'm like yeah like mm -hmm. that's the one a very easy way to um just you know minimize the brain stress of trying to figure it all out by yourself <laughs> 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 yeah oh my goodness drawing can definitely be a mind bender sometimes it really can and I always remind sometimes I sit here and I'm sketching and I'll be like wanting to sketch something and I'll be like racking my brain over how to draw it and then I'll like something will hit like girl look it up use a reference photo like why are you, <laughs> why are you sitting here trying to like force yourself to remember how to draw a frog from memory like it's okay <laughs> you can look it up all right so we have her little face here, her little neck, and this is her little breastplate. And she is half dachshund, so she has quite a large chest relatively to her body. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like short little legs, too. <laughs> but not as short as they could be because she's mixed with Chihuahua. Aww. So there is some anatomy stuff that is true to dogs. Like they're legs are at least for this breed like her legs are going to go in and her little feet are going to uh poke out so that's definitely something that will help inform the shape like okay this is definitely a dog and not some type of other random alien critter um and now I'm just roughly putting in the flowers from the flower crown here and this side of her back looks a little wider just because her body is disappearing into the background there but again I'm going to be surrounding her in plants which now I'm going to start kind of roughly just off of the cuff of my head just putting in leaf shapes and kind of uh, some expressive flower shapes I tend to just use what I know. Um, but again, like it doesn't have to always be a brain teaser. Like we can look up references. Um, you can trace elements if you need to, like ain't no shame in that game. But I'm just gonna add a variety of vine plants and large leafy situations. Scale really doesn't matter. I'm just being um, loose with it. And I just want the plants to look dynamic because she's a dynamic girl. I think these are fun that they're a mix of realist and then some of the imaginative of bringing in the personality elements. So you've got that just creative, little creative outlet. Yeah. And while I'm doing this, I want to be sure that it still like feels balanced. Um, in some way. So I'm just putting in, adding extra as I see fit to see like, okay, does that feel like a balanced image? Um, and this looks pretty good, I think. So my next step is going to be refining this um, in the way that I choose. So this is at this point, truly just preference. How are you gonna color this in? Do I want to refine the lines with color pencil or do I just wanna go straight in with paint? Um, 
I think today I want to go in with paint. So we're going to do that. I have a cup of water right here. And I also have a, uh, a napkin. Clean my brush and my paint. Natasha, I've got a question about the lettering you did. Have you, um, was lettering anything you've ever studied or found some resources for? Or is that something that just has just come from your own personal play? Um, it comes from personal play. This right here is just my handwriting. I'm a part of one of the last generations to learn cursive in school. Um, so <laughs> that's a thing. So I, I know how to write in cursive. And I uh, went to a school where we actually have to turn our papers in in cursive. So I have a, a solid handwriting. Um, but when I am looking for font inspiration or typography inspiration, I just go on the internet. I go on the internet and I look at things and I either, in the past I have purchased fonts to use like in programs, but I've also just played around with just like sketching what I see, taking elements from multiple fonts and bringing them together to create something new, um, things like that. Mm. First, I need to bring this, um, I have a kneaded eraser here that I'm just going to use real quick to pull up some of this pigment. Okay. Uh, I don't do have a brown in my palette. Yes, ha ha. And that's why watercolor is awesome because I mixed this brown in here who knows how long ago. <laughs> yeah, I always kind of laugh at having a messy palette, but. I like to call like I get palette gray from like the colors I mix together on my palette because mm -hmm. I always want to save the nice stuff I've got. <laughs> and the I am a full believer in keeping a messy palette, like especially with watercolor, it just feels wasteful to clean it. Honestly, like unless it gets really out of hand, where at the point the whole thing is palette gray, then like okay, that's one thing. But I will use and abuse a palette for sure. So I'm just color blocking currently. That's how I start all of my um, paintings. I do a light wash and block in the color. I will you, didn't, you didn't worry about like doing any erasing. You just sketch lightly enough that. Yes, I did use the kneaded eraser to pull up a little bit um, that I thought was a little heavy, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, that's. I just try and draw light enough, but I just want a light wash so that I'm not working on the white paper when I start layering. And so I'm just gonna choose some type of like medium green and just fill in this whole green area. And this is a good base for any type of multimedia work. like. From here, I don't have to watercolor paint anymore. I can play with pastels. I can go in with color pencil, which I'll do a little bit of after I do a couple layers. But um, doing a watercolor base is a really fun way to uh, play with mixed media. It's nice that those materials all play friendly together. Yes. Um, I want to say. It's like the, like you want to have the water down first and then do like oily, anything oily on top of that. Mm -hmm. Fat that over lean. Good. Maybe that rings a bell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I worked with oils a little in college too, but it's been a long time. I have committed myself to watercolors years ago because, but it's fun to play with other materials, at least for me yeah it was like I kind of learned that the hard way I was doing this mural and I didn't know the rule and I want to say I did like the spray paint first and then I tried to like paint over it with acrylic or something like that I don't know it just ended up peeling off or like being weird and I was like I just I was just sitting there like okay I have no idea what I'm doing obviously like I was in college at the time. Oh, 
Oh, that sounds stressful. <laughs> Put all that work <laughs> in. Also embarrassing. Okay. Because when I say there was a bunch of artists there working and <laughs> I very much embarrassed myself because oh. I, my stuff was coming out looking crazy. Okay. So I have a good base here. Where's my little, use a piece of mail or something. And this, I just want to get this to dry really well. Um, so that the paint does not lift up when I go in with my other labels. This is the hard part right here. Latasha is the patience for things to dry. <laughs> oh, for sure. For sure. When I do my watercolor class, I always tell people like in the intro, like watercolor painting is a test of patience. There's going to be at least one person here that's not patient and that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we will work with it. Okay, so I'm going to use watercolor to inform the shape of the dog a little more by going in with a little bit of a darker hue um, and give a little more form to her body so she doesn't look so flat and 2D. But I want to mix up more of a, a reddish. Yeah, something like that. Okay. So we got her little neck, right? And I'm just looking at my reference photo and I'm looking at the darkest parts and essentially just putting my paintbrush down on the dark parts. Those dark values are just so much what makes things pop, huh? Yeah, it really does um, change the way your eye views the artwork and takes in the information. Like even those couple strokes, like she looks so much more like a dog. Mm -hmm. It gives her dimension. All right, and so we have that and I'm gonna let that dry. While I'm letting that dry, I'm going to use a very dark green to put in the like background, kind of almost like a shadow um, in between all of my plant shapes. So the plants pop off the page. I'm trying to think what color I want to uh, paint her name in. I'm not really sure, but I'm thinking about that as I go. Obviously, underneath of her is going to be the darkest bit. And I can still see my drawing through my watercolor wash because I was very careful about making sure the first layer is not too dark. And if you paint heavy handed on the first layer, that's cool because you can always, once it dries, you can just go back in with pencil and put your sketch back in again so that you don't have to guess. I'm just going in. This is a really fun progression of shapes from the biggest shapes and now the darker shapes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think I want to do one more layer of the paint before I move to the uh, color pencil. And I want to um, add some variety of green into my plants so that it doesn't feel so boring. And you'll see what I mean by that. So I want to make like a, and I want the paint to be quite wet so that it blends really well. Latasha, I can tell uh, you know plants well that you're just able to pull these fun leaves and shapes from your imagination. <laughs> <laughs> I do so much work with plants like, I have like a catalog of plants that I can draw off the top of my head. And that's just from experience and time because 
I have quite the collection in my apartment. So a lot of times for work, I would just pull plants from my collection and draw them. And that's why I have like a little catalog in my head because I've used so many of my own plants after a while. I just mm -hmm. know what they look like. All right, so I'm mixing yellows in and I'm also mixing reds in with the green. When you mix red and green, that's kind of my favorite because I think it's like one of the lesser known combos, but it gives you like that olive, that Katamala olive kind of color. Yeah, I love that wet and wet mixing on the page you're getting with those yellows and greens blending together. Yeah, it's like a really good base for when you go in with another tool to like define the outlines and stuff and add the details. You have this fun mixture of colors uh, sitting under it. And I'm just going in with a wet brush, a clean wet brush and just blending um, my color blobs further. Okay. You mentioned um, colored pencil. Do you ever use uh, much ink too, or you um, gravitate towards some other media? I have used ink uh, as a finishing on my watercolors in the past. Color pencil is actually something that I have just recently started experimenting with. Um, all right, so I'm gonna let this dry while I work on her name. And for this, I'm gonna use oil pastel just because I really like the um, texture. I don't know what color I wanna use yet though. Hmm. I think this one, this reddish color. All right, so I'm just gonna go in with this bad boy. And any leftover pencil marks can just easily be erased after the fact if it's not already covered in whatever new medium you're using. And then I can never leave anything well enough alone. So now I have to go <laughs> with uh, some type of other color to make it like pop more off the page. But I have to be careful not to drag my hand through the wet paint. So oh, I bet that's something else you've learned before. <laughs> but watercolor is more forgiving than people think. So you can, you know, clean it up if you need to. Yeah. <laughs> this is giving like baseball, uh, baseball team vibes, but we're going with it. <laughs> Cute. Excuse my squeaky disc. Ooh, I'm kind of a mess. I don't know. I just like having fun with it. When I start pulling out other mediums, I just feel like I'm having so much fun. <laughs> uh, there's something about these like, I don't know, like crayons and pastels that just feel so innocent and childlike. Okay. So now I'm going to use the color pencil to, um, now that this, her figure is dry, to inform some texture by using cross hatching. And color pencil looks really good on watercolor paper if you are into the textured look. I'm also going to use the same pencil to uh, outline her features and start really pulling out the, the details. 
And I'm looking at my reference photo constantly so that my brain doesn't start making up stuff. This seems like the fun stage of getting to like sculpt a little bit more. <laughs> Have things pop. Like you're bringing it all together now. Mm -hmm. And then got to put her eyes in. I feel like the eyes are the scariest part for me because it really like anchors the face. And if you get it wrong, it looks nuts. <laughs> Aha, we did it. Eyeball placement success. And then my baby got a really dark bottom lip. It's really cute. So we'll put that in. <laughs> and I'm happy that I left a lot of this portion white because the poor thing is going gray. So it's very accurate. And that's why you start out with such a light wash because it ends up working in your favor as you build up the layers. You're getting some comments of other people talking about sharing the uh, nervousness around the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> it's the hardest part. Okay, I need to define them more because sometimes when a piece just isn't feeling right, I just need to like beef up one section better. I think I'm going to use pencil. That just feels easiest. Latasha, you've inspired me to pull out my colored watercolor pencil set that I've had since I was about 10, 12 years old. Oh my gosh. My daughter likes to borrow. I've managed somehow not to lose a pencil, though some of them are much shorter. <laughs> That's incredible. I don't use it as often as I should. Thanks for the invitation to play. Yeah, like play is so important. And that's something like, man, like I need to really preach to myself, which is hard when when art, it's your job. Um, because I I rarely feel like I have the the space to play because I am spending a lot of my creative time in work mode. Um so sadly for me, that ends up looking like being creative in other ways like I really dove back into knitting um, in the last year finding different outlets mm -hmm. okay. that's probably a whole other conversation of <laughs> for sure different creative play okay so Mr. Admins. And I'm just moving quickly across the page, looking at my reference. Can't stress that enough. Trying to be quick and not too rigid so that it keeps a fun, playful, artistic quality to it. Now I need to define her little toes. Okay. Our friend April Wu um, is commenting that she gets super nervous when doing commissions, but when painting for herself, that's often the best work. <laughs> yeah, actually, I'm the other way around. Like, I rather, I feel like I'm more, I find commissions easier because they're prompts. Um, I just get so intimidated by a blank page sometimes. And Sadly, I've fallen back into, like, I spoke on that when it came to my school, and I feel like I've fallen back into that with my work, where it's kind of like, I struggle if I don't have a prompt, because I'm so used to commercial illustration being my thing, where it's like I have a, it's like creative problem solving, essentially, and uh, yeah, it can sometimes muddle what playtime can look like. So well, that's nice. I think back to you, like starting this project of paint of pet portraits that you gave yourself a project, like you gave yourself a prompt 
to mm-hmm. play within some, you know, some guidelines. Yeah. And it's, um, it's just really important. Like if you want to be a food illustrator, you need to make food illustrations. Like you need to find someone who maybe is a, a chef or whatever, or if you're a chef yourself, like you need to give yourself the prompt and the deadlines to, um, create a body of work as if you were being hired by someone to do so like that's really at least for me that's the only way it's going to get done because sadly we don't take ourselves as seriously as we take like other people (laughs) if that makes sense I hope I'm not like not making sense but you know what I'm saying like it's way easier well not way easier but you're going to get up at a certain time to clock into work for somebody else whereas like it's a lot harder to like have the motivation to get up and be productive on your own accord um if there's no like repercussions for not doing so right yeah deadlines are super useful tools and you know I even think it's it's what where the support of even people who have like creative groups like the urban sketchers or things where going out and giving yourself like the structure and I feel like um um, I completely relate to that, uh, whether it's personal work or, or for like a professional more project or commission that having like giving some sort of structure gives you like the occasion to kind of rise to. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And yeah, and not everybody works on that uh, method, you know, so like whatever works for you, do what you got to do. But definitely like if you're trying to be a creative in whatever field, you can't just sit around waiting for somebody to hire you for something that they don't know you're even capable of doing. Um, you have, and then like, and why I'm saying it has to be like some type of client or like some type of like, it has to feel real. That's the only way it's going to um, feel real to potential clients where like, even if so, if you want to do product design, design your own soda design your own lotion bottle whatever but like put together an entire brand kit for this fake lotion bottle like make it feel really real so that um when it's in your portfolio it seems like this is a legit thing but it's like no I made this up but good thing I tricked you because that's the point (laughs) can you share um a little bit of what may be coming up or ways we can follow you and maybe any, any projects you're working on. I know you've mentioned you've got some workshops and other things and um, yeah. How can we, how can we keep in touch and follow you and, and anything else you're able to share about something cool you're working on? <laughs> um, you can talk about it. <laughs> yeah. And that, that do be the case. Like, can you really talk about it? Cause as a commercial illustrator, a lot of the times I'm working on products or, uh projects that aren't going to be released for sometimes years like isn't that crazy but uh like right now I am doing a product collaboration again my previous product collaboration was a a shoe with Meryl and um which is no longer available it sold out but I'm doing something similar to that where I'm like my artwork will inspire a line of products for an outdoor brand but it I turned that artwork in this month and it won't the product doesn't release until winter 2024. Whoa. Yeah. uh, So can't really uh, boss like promote that because it's too far in advance. (laughs) I believe I'm doing, so there's this like water bottle company called Bivo. um, And I'm going to be doing a line of water bottles with them. And I'm pretty sure that's going to come out this year. So if you're like a cyclist or something, anything like an athlete, because these bottles are like, I mean, anybody can use it. It's just a water bottle, obviously, but they're crafted for like bicycles. So like you can like put it in your bike holder or whatever. And it's cool because the artwork will be laser etched onto it, which I've never um, seen my artwork in that application before, which I would just want to say that's like one of the, my favorite parts about being a commercial illustrator is that the way like through collaborating with brands I'm able to see my artwork in ways that I wouldn't be able to otherwise like on a freaking trail runner like when am I ever when would I ever be able to see my artwork imprinted on the sole of a trail running sneaker (laughs) that's awesome I didn't like collaborate with (laughs) other brands to do so um and so it's just really cool so I'm excited for that water bottle um 
to come out, uh, I think this summer, pretty sure is what they said, but yeah, it's going to be really cool. And other than that, I just have my online store that I'm always updating. I update it seasonally. So my next online store um, update will be at the end of next month, like for spring shop update. And it'll include lots of new stickers and prints. And all my work is like, you know, surround, surrounding the theme of art and nature. And uh, so that's essentially what the type of stuff in my shop is like as well. And we've got the link to your website and your Instagram too um, in the description of, um, of this video. Yeah. Awesome. Um, someone's curious what brand of watercolor pencils you're using. These are Prismacolor. It's actually a Mod Podge <laughs> of uh, Prismacolor, Crayola, and Rose Art. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally three different price points but um I have such a mod podge of art supplies over my entire life because I've been an artist my entire life but most of my color pencils are Prismacolor I would say 80 percent of them and then I just have a few from my like college and high school <laughs> um yeah but this is uh pretty much it oh it's lovely I love the shapes of the leaves that have come through and the little expression that you've captured on her face <laughs> <laughs> which is oh very much so her like she's an expressive girl like she taught like she's not I mean like as a small dog she kind of yippy a little bit like not nearly as much as most people's dogs but she expresses herself through her eyes and mm -hmm. her facial expressions more than anything, I feel like. Um, well, gosh, we are we are just about um, at our time. And um, Latasha, it's just been such a joy to learn more about your work and um, to get to to make art along with you. Um, I want to want to thank you so much. And I want to invite anyone who's followed along with our demo and created something along the way to please post on Instagram. You can tag us at Art Toolkit and Latasha um, at Jitterbug Art. Is that right, Latasha? Yeah. Um, which is also in our um, description of this video. Um, Latasha, I feel like I should give you a little peek at, at what I made here. <laughs> I'll pull up our faces. Um, let's see here. Um, here's my little, uh, little Lilo. <laughs> you can she see I, <laughs> I had a harder time with the, uh, the plants than you. <laughs> um, but you I had, I had fun. That. that is just too cute. <laughs> and, um, thanks for encouraging me to, and all of us to play with, um, some different media too. I can't remember the last time I've just gone and put like watercolor pencil over watercolors and just messed around like that. So thanks for inviting a little play into my day and, and all of ours. Um, and um, yeah, is there anything else um, we should know about for following you? We've got your website, um, Instagram, um, and looking for updates. Yeah, pretty much. I, um, I have a lot of, I mean, there's people chiming in from all over the place, but I'm doing local like Denver local art markets all year I have a very packed market schedule um I love selling my work in person like being able to talk to people about the art and like the locations of the landscapes and stuff like that is really awesome so I'm going to be putting up a schedule of my art markets on my website but pretty much Instagram oh and Patreon I'm so bad at promoting my Patreon but I do have a monthly art subscription service through Patreon, where I do a monthly podcast newsletter um, for the lowest tier. The tier above that, you get a coloring page every mm -hmm. month. The tier above that, you get a sticker mailed to you. And the very top tier, you get a print mailed to you. And all the tiers like are cumulative. So like, if you have the top tier, you get all of this stuff. 
vice versa, you know? So um, I've been loving it. This is my third year doing it. And um, this year we're doing like illustration collection. So each month, the coloring page, the print and the sticker are all like a collection of art. And like, it's been really cute. So every month I post what the rewards will be on my Instagram. So people, Patreon super chill. You can come and go as you please. You get access to like everything that has ever been posted on there. When you join, you can join for one month and leave the next month. Like people do that. It's totally okay. Um, and yeah, that's just some ways to support me. <laughs> and can we find your Patreon on your website? Yep. Everything, awesome. everything's linked on my website. That, and that's like, if you're an artist and you don't have a website, please do not put all your pennies into social media. Cause we all see how much that stuff breaks down whenever it's out of your control. Like I love having my website. I paid for it. it I just updated it. It has everything on there. I've ever done my podcast interviews, my, my like real interviews, like written interviews, like all my art collections, you can find links to all the stuff there. Oh, well, um, thank you again, Latasha. And thank you everyone so much um, who joined us for um, this afternoon and look forward to being in touch. Yeah. <laughs> Bye everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.